Good afternoon. All right, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, thanks for having me here. Today, I'm going to give a very interesting talk about running. All right, you guys all run 2.4, right? I suppose most, right? Anybody running a marathon this year? Or last year, Stan Sharp Marathon? Oh, there, oh, oh, oh. Over there, 42 km. Ah. What a solid, man. Hey, but Daryl, you told me you don't go out of the house, right? But, okay, fantastic, all right. Guys, so today I'm going to talk about uh, running. I currently work at NUH. La. I work in the sports surgery department. Uh, my main role is to do surgery for patients with knee ligament injuries, like ACL tears and so on. And we work closely with the sports medicine department, okay? So I'll also introduce my partner in crime today, Daniel, soon, all right? All right, so just to share with you some, make, make my talk more credible, la, okay? I need to make me sound credible so that you will listen to me. So I used to run a lot, all right? I used to run a lot. Um, in in uh, 2007, I won a Southeast Asian Games gold medal in a triathlon event. Anybody else used to do triathlon? Swim, cycle, run. Uh, crazy. Uh. Now I cannot already. You swim 1.5 km, then you cycle 40 km, and then you run 10 km. Yeah. But some people are even more crazy. They do the Iron Man, you know. Iron Man is about, they, they end off a marathon for 2 km. So that's really tough, right? Uh, then in 2013, I ran the marathon and won a uh, gold medal in Myanmar. This was when I was doing my MOCC in Isun Camp. I booked out a few days before, <laughs> fly there. You know, to Myanmar, and and thank God managed to win the Sea Games. Um, well, I want to say that I I also won an international marathon in New Zealand, but the secret is because in two thousand eleven there was an earthquake, so nobody go la. so I know I win the so I, I can call myself an international marathon winner. All right, um, I won the Singapore marathon seven times, and I was so called a professional runner, meaning I took one year off work to try to train professionally to try to qualify for the Olympics in two thousand sixteen. That was in Rio that year, but I failed to qualify. And I went to US, Boulder, Colorado to train at a high altitude. Because when you train at a high altitude, your, your body produces more red blood cells to help you run faster. Okay. Um, all right. So th that's what I do now. We do knee surgeries. And uh, this is a picture of me uh, being a commentator at the Stan Chart Marathon last year. So my wife say, whenever they invite you for these kind of things, it means you have retired already. La. All right. So I do accept that. All right. Retired runner. Okay, and, and I also regularly teach medical students from NUS. Okay, so that's me. All right, and I'm going to introduce my, my buddy here, Daniel. All right, Daniel, uh, is a, he just passed out from uh, OCS in the Navy and he's currently uh, being a Deputy S3. Okay, I'm just going to read this out because I don't really know what it means, all right? 9 Fortilla Changni Defense Squadron Navy. All right, he just came from Changni Naval Base earlier. Um, well, we met because we have a shared interest in running. All right, if you search 2.4 km training, the number one hit on Google will be his article. You may or may not have read it, all right? How to get good at running a 2.4 km, a comprehensive guide. So here you have the, the number one hit about 2.4 km is here to answer some of your questions, all right? Okay, so I want to get to know you guys also. Y'all can y'all have handphones, nah? Got handphones, right? Okay, this is not a primary school, huh? Okay, y'all log into slido.com. There are a few survey questions asking you about, you know, some background because I'm very curious about whether you guys have smart watches and so on. All right, come. You all can uh, you go to slido.com, log in, 354433. It's too far for you to scan. All right, you just log in, 354433, slido.com. Let's see, let's have some interaction. All right, how many people here? 70 people I heard. All right, come. All right, give you a few minutes here. Yeah, so I heard the topic for this month's safety talk is really all about physical ex exercise and uh, and also talking about progressive training, right? So I think it's really going to tie in really well, all right? Because we're going to talk about specifically in running, what is the optimal way to run your best 2.4 km, all right? The best way to run the 2.4 km. Wow, fantastic, man. Not bad, huh? Quite, quite interactive here. Okay, let's just quickly just go through some answers, right? Okay. Do you own a smartwatch? Wow, about 50% actually own a smartwatch. That's quite interesting, right? All right, less than half of you do not own. 
Interesting, right? Because nowadays smartwatches are so easily available, right? And they come with onboard heart rate monitors and that we can harness it to train uh, train well as well, okay? Garmin 12%, interesting, uh, Apple Watch. Okay, do you follow a training program for the 2.4 km? Well, not bad. One third actually follow. Well, not bad, not bad. 70% don't, okay? Interesting statistics here. The next question is, what is the... Huh? No, but this is what? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, what is the largest hurdle preventing you from following a training program? Motivation, no energy. Wow, life is tough, right? I mean, sometimes you're working and so on, studies. It can be very tiring, right? No interest, just pass, no interest in running. Fair enough, right? That is, we cannot expect everybody to be interested in running, right? Uh, knowledge, not sure where to start, 20%. Cost, 7%. Lonely, no one to run with. All right, we can run with you, all right? <laughs> no but okay, very, very interesting here. All right. Okay, so you can ask questions anytime, all right? Through the platform also, so we can get a QA and a session uh, going later on. Okay, so today we will cover three things, all right? Number one, three principles for optimal 2.4 km training. All right, I'm going to combine all my experience and what I understand about running and present to you three optimal tips to train for 2.4 km, how to put it all together in a plan. And finally, three takeaways from my running journey. Okay, now, first of all, if we're going to talk about specificity, specificity, right? We need to be specific in our training. Now, now to break things very simple, our body has two energy systems, all right? The aerobic and the anaerobic, okay? I'm aware not everybody of you understand this terminology. I'm going to break it down very easily, right? Now, in terms of the aerobic system, we are talking about glucose in our body with oxygen, all right? It gives you energy. And a lot of energy, all right? 36 to 38 ATP, which is the energy currency in our body, okay? And the byproducts are harmless carbon dioxide and water, aerobic system, okay? And then examples will be you sitting here. All of you guys here are probably using the aerobic system, right? Breathing, you know, in a comfortable manner. Now, how about the anaerobic system? In the anaerobic train, uh, exercise, you know, you're only using glucose. You can hold your breath and sprint 100 meters, correct? And that's going to be maximally an aer anaerobic event. However, you can see that it's very inefficient. The number of energy currency is only two. And the downside is that you're producing lactic acid. All right? Now, looking at this, I just put a chart of money here, no? You know, everybody likes money, right? But nevertheless, you can see the difference, right? The aerobic system gives you more money than the anaerobic system. All right? Keep it very simple, right? Aerobic. Anaerobic, all right, aerobic is more efficient. All right, you see that here, right? Okay, now, I want you to guys to guess now, because we need to drill this into 2.4 km. If I tell you these two ideas with the aerobic and anaerobic, what is the ratio of aerobic to anaerobic in the 2.4 km based on your experience? Is it closer towards a 100-meter sprint or is it closer to you sitting here enjoying the aircon? Which extreme do you think, right? What do you think is the ratio? Is it aerobic 20% and aerobic 80%? Or is it aerobic 40% and aerobic 60%? You know, I'm just playing the numbers here. Lah. But which is the ratio you think for the 2.4 kilometers? Six rounds around the track. Is it more aerobic or anaerobic? Hey, come guys, everybody, use your phones. Ah, use your phones, guys. Okay, come, have a few more people. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's see. Ah, look at this. So the majority of people says 40% aerobic, right? Can you see? But the idea, hey, you're playing the numbers, guys. Okay, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Don't spoil the quiz. Huh? Okay, the answer is aerobic 80%. Aerobic 80%. Is it, does it surprise you, anybody? Wow, now is the correct answer. Okay, wow, you guys are really fast fingers, man. Huh? Should only limit to one uh, entry per user. But nevertheless, you can see, I think it, sometimes it's a culture shock. When I tell people that it's actually majority aerobic, people get a shock because the experience in the 2.4 came is an unpleasant one, right? You push so hard, cannot be 80% aerobic. But nevertheless, that is true. Now let us look at this chart here, all right? This is a chart that shows the energy system distribution, all right? And what you see in red color is the anaerobic. The blue color is aerobic, right? And this is the increasing distance from zero all the way to 3,500 meters. Now, if you're going to draw 2.4 km right smack in the middle here, you see aerobic is close to 80%. Anaerobic 
20%. Now, this is very crucial, right? Because we're going to use this information to work backwards to how to optimally train for a 2.4, right? Now, so what is the next question, right? So what if it's 80% aerobic? Well, then the, logically, the logic that comes out of this information, this truth should be, if 80% of energy comes from the aerobic system, that means 80% of your training should be aerobic. Correct or not? Makes sense or not? If your training consists of going out there, ha hammering on the anaerobic system, you're actually not training optimally. You are training too hard. Make sense? Right? So based on this logic, 80% of your training should be aerobic. All right? And training must be specific to the distance you are training for. Now, let's see some proof, right? How do I apply this even for myself? Now, I used to run for a marathon, right? And if you look at this, right, the marathon is actually close to 97% aerobic. All right? So when I was in US, I ran a lot. You know, I spent like hours running. Look at this. For easy runs, I spent 11 hours a week running. Easy. Having a conversation. Training the aerobic system. My hard workouts only take one hour a week. Can you see? What is the ratio? It's about 90 is to 10. So I am specific to my training for the marathon, right? You can see here. And this is how my schedule looks like. Every day in blue is all easy aerobic runs. Only two sessions of hard runs, all right? And I was training with Olympic standard runners. So you need to be specific. If you're training for 2.4, you need to obey the principle of specificity in order to train optimally. If not, your runs are unnecessarily hard. You are not going to enjoy your training at all. All right? Okay, very good. Now, second question now is precision. How can I be precise, right? Because we talk about this, right? Aerobic versus anaerobic. Now, the real question is this. How do you know which system you are utilizing right now? How can you know? All right, that's a question, right? Because we want to be very precise in controlling our training effort. Now, the simple answer to this is this. You just need to measure what is being produced. Lactate, right? As long as there's lactate in your body, it means that you are in the anaerobic, you are using anaerobic respiration. Because if you are purely using the aerobic system, you should not have any lactate. Make sense? That's why, in a, let's say in a car accident, uh, the patient comes to the hospital, we check their lactate levels. Because the higher the lactate levels, the more stressed the patient is. Because the patient is using a lot of anaerobic respiration. Okay? So, very simple. So, in terms of training, that's what we do also. In order to know whether we are precise in which zone, we need to test your lactate. Okay? And that's what I used to do. We go onto a lab test, right? I run on the treadmill this way back in 2007 or something like that. Lah, huh? I look quite young then. Huh? Okay, so this is what we do. As an athlete, right, we do laboratory testing to be very, very precise, right? How does it work? We run progressively faster and faster and faster on the treadmill, right? And every five minutes, somebody will poke my skin and get some blood out to check for the lactate levels, okay? And what they do is that you plot a graph here, you see? from zero lactate to a uh, moderate amount of lactate and then shoot all the way up. You see, as you run faster and faster, you are using the anaerobic system more and more, right? And to be precise, you need to check the lactate levels. Now, the problem is this, right? The downside is that we have no way as we go on our training runs around Nisun camp, how to check your lactate acid, correct or not? It is not practical, right? Therefore, we have a problem here. I cannot check your lactate now to tell you which zone you're using. We need some kind of surrogate measure, right? So the solution here is to translate your lactic acid levels to something that is measurable. Something that is measurable right now. Isn't that the best, right? And that is the role of the lab testing. The lab testing is trying to correlate the lactate levels to something that is measurable that you have right now. All right, so now the question is very simple already. So what other ways can I use to measure intensity other than lactate levels? Other than lactate levels, right? Now, few options. Power. Any of you are cyclists, serious cyclists? Not many. Right, the cyclists, right, Tour de France, they use a power meter. That means every step they push, uh, there is an objective number, the power that is being output by the legs. That is very, very objective. But in running, unfortunately, we don't have such a technology yet. All right, so we can't do that. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard of the talk test, right? Feeling talk test, right? That means no matter, depending on how well you can talk and have a conversation, it can suggest what intensity you're running at, whether you're using the aerobic or anaerobic. The next option is heart rate. All right, that means how high your heart rate. The higher the heart rate, the likelihood of you in anaerobic is higher. 
or the pace, right? Let's say use the GPS watch, the faster you run, the chances are you're running the anaerobic zone, right? So you see, so the whole purpose of lab testing is to correlate your lactate concentration and plot it with power, feeling, heart rate, or pace. And then you draw a chart. Then you can be very precise. You can choose the exact heart rate you're training at, and you know exactly what is the system you are training. Isn't that very precise? We all want precision, right? You don't want the palang anyhow train, right? Even in you know, other aspects of your life, you want precision. And that's what you're trying to maximize your time in, in 2.4 km training, right? Now, the question therefore now is which one is the best? Which is the best, all right, that is measurable on our runs daily, okay? Now, number one, let's talk about the three options, uh, the top test, the heart rate, and the pace. And let's look at the downsides and the advantages of each, all right? So number one, this is how I plot it, right? You can say that, okay, easy, that means you can sing a song when you run. If you're at a threshold, you can talk in sentences. If you're running very, very hard, you can only talk in words. That's how someone will tell you, lah, to suggest to you what zone you're training at, right? The advantage, of course, is that it is free. Wow, fantastic. Everybody loves free gifts, right? Huh? I give you a free meter here. Whether you can sing, talk in words, or talk in sentences, you can have a free meter in your body, right? And it's always present. Don't need to charge one. Wow, solid. Not bad, right? Okay? But there are disadvantages, of course, right? Disadvantages, right? It's subjective. In fact, I know many, many people, after I talk to them, I ask them, how easy is a run? They say, very easy. Then I check their heart rate. Wow, so high. There's no way it is easy. That means somehow, by running too hard too often, your thermostat in your brain spoil. You know? The thermostat spoil. That means whatever is hard, like, you also think it's easy already. So there is a problem. It is subjective and it can go haywire. It can go haywire, right? Now, what's the option? It's inaccurate, okay? Now, the second option is heart rate. Heart rate, right? Now, 10 years ago, all of us, to measure heart rate, you must wear a heart rate strap, you know? Heart rate strap, very uncomfortable. But nowadays, you know, those people with smart watches, the 50% plus will have an onboard heart rate monitor using optical sensor. Amazing, right? So simply, if you want to use the heart rate as a way to differentiate the different zones, you will go by the number of beats per minute, right? So for example, easy will be less than 140 beats per minute. You for sure know you're in an aerobic zone, right? Between 141 to 160, you'll be in a threshold zone. And then if you're more than 160, you know it's a hard zone. Can you see? Right? So with heart rate, you can be very precise. By looking at the heart rate monitor, you can be very confident to say that right now, I'm using the aerobic system only or using the anaerobic system. Very, very confident, right? Okay, now the advantages is this, right? It is now very accessible. 50% of you right now have it. Amazing. I, do you know how to use it? That's the thing, right? We want to learn how to use it in an easy manner so that you can maximize your training, okay? And it's very objective. It's not go by feeling. Objective. Right, it is not by feeling, okay. And you get real time feedback. You can check your watch anytime during the run, and you tell you exactly what zone you're running at. Very, very useful, right? Now the limit. There are, however, three main limitations that we need to be aware of. Three main limitations. Number one, you need to wear the watch properly. If you wear it very loose, then it cannot detect well. That's why on the heart rate chart, if you see all these random blips, uh, it means that this person did not wear the watch properly. It must be worn tightly against your skin. Number one, all right? If you rubbish in, rubbish out. You don't wear properly, you get rubbish data, okay? Secondly, it takes time to catch up. It takes time to catch up. For example, if I ask you to run 1,000 meters, 1, 2.4 km now, the first two, three minutes, it could, be, it could reflect a very low heart rate, correct or not? Because it slowly picks up. So there is a lag time. That's why when you look at this chart here, the black color is the speed, right? How fast you are running, right? But you can see that the green color heart rate lags behind. It lags behind for each interval. So there is a lag time. A lag time. Now, finally, is the cardiac drift. And this is especially prominent in Singapore where it's hot and humid. What does it mean? It means that if you're running at a constant pace, for example, look at the gray line. This is your pace, right? You can see there's a relatively straight line. However, your heart rate, look at this, it slowly goes up. Even though you are running at the same pace and intensity. So this is called the cardiac drift. All right, so there are some limitations. Some limitations, right? Now, the third one is pace. Pacing means how fast you run. What is the number of minutes per second, right? Um, so for example, if you use that, then you say like, okay, if I'm running less than six minutes per km, then it's easy, and so on and so forth. If you're running faster than four minutes per km, then it's hard, you see? Then you can objectively know which zone you are using. 
Now, there are two main ways to measure, right? You can either be of the primitive method, which is go onto the track, you'll be very, very accurate, right? You know exactly one round is 400 meters. The other way is to use a GPS watch. But GPS watch has its limitations. If you use a GPS watch and you run on the track, it's going to show that you run extra. Because every time you start turning, the GPS thing you haven't turned yet, right? Because there's a lag time. So therefore, there is limitation to GPS watch, right? Especially if you want to be very, very precise in how fast you are running, okay? Now, the advantages of using pace is that it's very objective, just like heart rate, right? Very objective. You can know exactly how fast you're running. And the good thing is that it allows you to run at a certain race pace that you are planning for, right? That means if you plan your mind to run this certain pace for 2.4, you can actually start to practice that doing your using the pace method. Right now, the disadvantages is that the GPS is not suitable, right, for track or short intervals, and may not correspond to climate and temperature. Because when you're running, when you're when you're getting tired already, you run slower. It does not mean your heart rate drop. You know your heart rate is still high, right? Can you see? So that is the limitations of using pace only. Now, so therefore now we have three options, right? Right now, now so to summarize, laboratory testing aims to correlate lactate levels, right? Lactate levels to a metric that is measurable, that is measurable, right? So the first one option can be the talk test. Sing, talk in sentence, or talk in words, right? Other option is using heart rate based on the number of beats per minute, and finally pace, right? How slow or how fast you are running to determine which zone you are running it. Now, really understand the three zones here on this chart here. The easy zone you can see is that there is zero production of lactic acid, right? The line is still flat. Okay, in the threshold zone, this is where lactic acid is equals to the clearance. There is very little or no accumulation. Very little or no accumulation. And finally, in the hard zone, that's where the lactic acid accumulates exponentially, right? It shoots upwards. That's where we know you're very stressed, right? If you keep training in the anaerobic zone, which I know some people do every day, go and whack 2.4, now it's going to make you in a very stressed state, you know, and it's going to make running very uncomfortable and not enjoyable, correct? Okay, so now we know there are three zones here. Now the question is this, well, well like that everybody must do lab tests. Uh. Why not? Like that like, sounds like very expensive, right? And it's very expensive, guys. I can come here and sell you a package, you know, 199, you come to NEH, do a lab test. All right, but that's not the purpose of this, right? You know why? Because the gold standard is to correlate this to a lab test. However, we know there are some limitations also. For example, I can say that you run a lab test in an aircon environment. Can I translate it to running outside? A bit hard, right? So there are limitations. We need to be aware there's limitations to everything, right? Because we're living in a broken world, right? But nevertheless, the question is, do we really need an expensive lab test? Now, the answer is, I don't think so, right? Because for my one year training in the US, training with the top Olympic runners, all right? And uh, my coach is Lee Troop. He's an Australian four times Olympian, all right? And his approach to training is, he always say, keep it simple, right? And they focus on making sure you are training the right zones, Okay, making sure you have a high volume of easy runs in the aerobic zone, and then let the results come along as you add in some of the harder efforts. So I don't think you need any lab tests to be precise and specific in your training. All right, so the question to ask here is how can we do without a lab test to be precise? Now, this is how I have been applying this principle throughout my running career. This is how I've been applying, right? I use heart rate and pace for different things, right? I will recommend the heart rate, all right, and the track and, and pace. I use heart rate, all right, for the easy and the threshold. And I use track pace to train my anaerobic, okay? All right, look at this. Uh. So basically, I utilize heart rate for the aerobic and the anaerobic, okay, as well as pace for the heart. That's how I do it because I'm working around the limitations of each one, okay? Now, so this is how I do it. So why do I use heart rate for easy and threshold runs? Why? Right, because it is objective, it is cheap, it is accessible. 50% of us can start using it today, right now, to train efficiently at your easy and threshold zones, right? And we know that pace varies with terrain. Like if you, let's say, you're going to run on a hilly course around Nisun, then you, your pace will drop, right? But that does not necessarily mean that you're running at a low intensity, correct? So heart rate is more reflective when you're running in various terrains. And it can be very stressful to maintain a high pace, right? Especially when the hot and humidity and so on. So there's some limitations to pace. And why you see in this chart here, there are three zones in, in the easy zone. There are three zones, there are sub zones, right? And zone one is for warming up before workouts. Zone two 
all right, is for the first 30 minutes of easy runs. Zone three is to for runs that are more than 30 minutes to cope with the cardiac drift, right? That we talk about, right? So zone one, zone two, zone three, they are all under easy and they are all under the aerobic training, okay? And because to accommodate for cardiac drift, we need to give some leeway in the next 30 minutes of the run to allow your cardiac to drift up nicely, even while we are running at the same intensity and pace. Okay, and the threshold zone is also using heart rate, all right, 80 to 90% heart rate. Now, what heart rate will be the question, right? What heart rate to run at then? Now, firstly, you need to estimate your maximum heart rate and there are various calculations out there, okay? And once you use those formulas, such as your H, 220 minus H of different formulas, then you can calculate your maximum heart rate. Once you get that, you divide into the zones, right? So easy zone, zone one will be 50 to 60% of the maximum heart rate. All right, zone two, 60 to 70%. Zone three is 70 to 80, right? For these three zones, when you're running at this heart rate, you know for sure you are training the aerobic system. You know for sure when you plug in your, 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 your blood, there's no lactate. That's the purpose, right? And in the threshold zone, 80 to 90%, right? There will be some small amounts of lactate, but not yet exponentially shooting up. And finally, the heart zone is 90 to 100%. However, right, you can see here, right? They're all corresponding in these areas, but because I don't use heart rate for the heart, right? Because I know that the heart rate has limitations. It does not allow me to train at race pace, for example. So I ignore it when I train. I just use it to collect data. That's how I use it, right? For zone one to four. Now for zone five, why not use heart rate? I talk about this, right? There's a heart rate lag. For example, if you're doing a workout on the track, every time you start running fast, your heart rate will still reflect that you're running slow. Right after one minute, two minutes, then you catch up. So therefore, using pace is much more objective, right? There's also a heart rate drift, right? Because what does this mean? That means if you you can actually start to run slower, all right, doing your workouts to maintain the same heart rate, and that is not beneficial if you're running race space training, right? So that's where there are some limitations. So for zone five, heart training to train an anaerobic system, I use the pace method, all right. And the good thing is this, right? When we run at the race pace, for sure, it will fall into the zone five heart rate anyway. For sure, it will fall in the zone five heart rate. Okay, now the question then is what pace to run at? What pace should we run at for the zone five, right? Now, this is how we do it. Firstly, all the watches now have an estimation of your VO2 max, okay? You take your, either take your smartwatch VO2 max estimation on your Apple Watch, Fitbit or Garmin, they all have the number. Or you can run a 1.2 km time trial, right? Go to the track, run th three rounds as fast as you can. From this, either one of these methods, you can then get an estimate VO2 max. And then you can project your 2.4 km race pace. All right. And from there, you now know what to train at for your zone five. Okay. Be very, very specific, right? You can be very specific and precise in your training for your 2.4 km. All right. So this is how we do it, right? You get your watch value. You plug in the, cal the calculator, it will come out with a 2.4 km estimated race pace. Now, so a quick summary here for precision. Uh, precision. For aerobic, you are training the zone 1 to zone 3, right? Heart rate zone 1 for warm-ups, zone 2 for easy runs, zone 3 for easy runs more than 30 minutes to accommodate for cardiac drift in our hot and, climate, hot and humid Singapore, right? In the anaerobic, we have zones 4 and 5. Zones 4, you're still using the threshold method, all right? You're using the heart rate method to monitor and finally use pace to look at zone 5, all right? By using your VO2 max estimated race pace. Okay, so now you have the knowledge to be specific and you have the knowledge to be precise, okay? And now I just want to show you one proof again. Some of you may think that, wow, do you really keep all your runs so easy? Is it true that 90% of runs is run at easy intensity? Now, let me show you some proof, right? You really need discipline to slow down. All right, trust me. If you want to start this program, the first thing that will hit you is that, wow, I must run so slower. But it's true. It's true. But over time, as you improve, you'll find that you're running faster and faster at the same heart rate. That is true improvement. If not, you're just wasting your time. Okay? Now, so for example, looking at this, right? I can show you that based on the calculator, my heart rate zones for easy runs should be from 115 beats per minute to 132. Okay? So I'll show you this way in 2013 when I was very fit. Like, 2013, I went to the SEA Games gold medal, right? You see, I ran 35 km, you know, right? And my pace was 4 minutes, 8 seconds per kilometer. And my average heart rate of this 35 km is 140 beats per minute. 
right? It falls directly into the calculator, right? Or how about some shorter runs? Lah, huh? Look at this. This is a 7 km easy run, 35 minutes. My average heart rate is 119. I'm being very precise in my training. Or 15 km, 126. 25 km, 123. Look at this. The precision must be there. You need to train in the correct intensity. As you get fitter, you run faster and faster. Okay, that is the key to improvement, right? And even now in 224, when I'm less fit, I'm running much slower now, but I'm keeping to the pace that is prescribed, the heart rate that is prescribed for me to maximize my training. I don't want to waste time. I want to train optimally. Why waste time anyhow run when you have all the information on your wrist to run at the correct intensity, right? Don't be silly. Am I right? Isn't it? Okay, so now the last, the last principle I want to show you is the key of super compensation. This is very interesting, right? Now, I'm going to show you this very, very nice chart here, right? I don't know whether you guys learned about this in your progression uh, lecture just now, but this chart is very, very important. It was so crucial to me to understand this um, because it really helps you understand why the training program is made as such. So for example, this is your fitness baseline. After you start one training session, you will realize that your fitness drops because you're tired. Well, right? Now, make sense now, right? As you run a marathon today, you're tired, right? Your fitness will drop. But however, if you rest and recover, look at this your fitness goes up and you will undergo a super compensation phase. Look at this, right? Look at this. Your fitness surpasses your original fitness level. However, if you rest too much, what happens? It returns to baseline. Now, I'm going to give you three options. If I will ask you to plan the next training session or after a hard run today, where will you plan your next session? Everybody take out your watcher, take out your handphones now. When will you plan the next session? Will you plan it at point A Point B or point C on this super bond compensation curve. Where will you put it? A, all right. A sounds good, right? Great A, young great A, B or C, right? When will you plan the next training session on this super compensation graph? All right, let's see. Point B, well, it's exactly. So two thirds of you guys know, three quarters know that the key is to do at point B, right? Because why? Because if you capture your training at every time the point B, you will keep improving. However, if you overtrain and don't give yourself sufficient rest, you get worse and worse. Right? Why waste time, right? You want to be specific, you want to be precise, and you want to obey the rule of supercompensation to maximize every single training session. Okay? Now, how do we apply this? Well, it makes sense, therefore, that you need to have some rest days between sessions, right? Because what we say is rest is recovery. Rest is recovery, right? You need to allow yourself to super compensate, right? But then we know that too many rest days, however, will reduce the effectiveness. Wow, that is the struggle, right? To balance that. Too little, not good. Too much, we have wasted some of the effort, right? And of course, we need to consider other life stresses, right? Maybe you have exams coming, you know, you got some exercise, then you have to reduce the training load. If not, you cannot recover enough, right? Goal setting and setting expectation is key. And over the long run, guys, the consistency is always important. The longer you run in an injury-free manner, the better your performance. And the only way you can run injury-free is to control the training load in a reasonable manner, right? By not overtraining, not pushing too hard, by obeying the principles, okay? Now, so therefore, in summary, we have talked about being specific. You need to obey the aerobic to anaerobic ratio of the distance you're training at. Whether is it 2.4, 5K, 10K, or marathon. All right? Secondly, you need to be very precise. You need to train in the appropriate zone by using heart rate and pace guidance. And finally, you need to give super compensation some sufficient recovery time for you to optimize every single training session. Now, how do we put together in a plan? Now, let me show you a simple one. Now, first of all, in the weekly plan, this is how I plan out. We know the compensation curve, right? So therefore, this is how I plan. On a weekly basis, I have at least two days of rest between my heart sessions. And if you look at this chart, essentially after the heart workout, my fitness drops. But then I will super compensate. I will be ready for the next training. I will then fatigue a bit and then super compensate again. Now, this is what a weekly cycle will look like. Two heart sessions separated by two days in a micro session, all right? Micro weekly planning. Now in the macro scale, 
this is where we talk about different phases, right? And the first thing is that you need to have planned recovery weeks to prevent injury. That means after four weeks of training or so, you should have a planned recovery, all right, to allow your body to absorb all the training load so that you can further improve, right? And this is what it looks like for the super compensation to happen week in, week out. And that's how you really improve, right? You need to have planned recovery weeks because musculoskeletal adaptations always lag behind our cardiorespiratory, right? Because you don't hear people often, uh -huh, run away with their chest pain, so on, right? Thankfully, we don't have that often. But we hear a lot of people getting injured, right? That's because the musculoskeletal adaptations of your ligament and tendons take longer to catch up as you get fitter and fitter. So you need this plan recovery weeks, okay? Now, and then you talk about phases because you can't be doing, you can't be studying for PSLE on, on day one of primary school, right? You must phase yourself out. So the same for running, right? You need to have some uh, structure in your training to optimize this, right? So for example, a five uh, phase training program will be very, very logical, right? Firstly, you have the base session. The base is just focusing on zone two and zone three training for about four weeks. Then you recover. And then you do a threshold period where you increase the number of zone four training right? And then uh, as you go into more specific towards the race of 2.4, then you'll be more specific. And then there's a taper period to allow you to absorb the training and finally to race well, right? So that is very, very crucial. You need some general phases in endurance running. And again, we have planned recovery weeks every four weeks. You see? Now, now I'm going to share with you three running takeaways, all right, from my running journey, all right, over the last few years, all right? Now, first of all, you need to be very, very patient. You know, all of us want to start a program. We want fast results. We love fast food, isn't it? Right? No one wants to queue up. No one wants to focus on the aerobic system and get long-term gains. We want to push hard. We feel good and we feel tired. Then you think you did a good job. But really, you need to be patient, right? Often, we are always too greedy, right? Multiple studies have found that injury prevention paradox is this. We are training too hard, right? Too much too soon is the number one cause of injuries. Right? So you really need to be patient if you're going to embark and be fit in the long run. All right? And secondly, you need to be humble because there's so many things we don't know. Right? We have, I have told you all the general principles. But you ask me more and more details, I may have to say I may not know. All right? but, and this is true for many things. You know, even in surgery, I go to conferences, they always say that things like the joints around our bodies, they, the, the top professors always say there's so many things we don't know. For example, this guy, he has been doing surgery for 50 years for the AC out there. He says after 50 years, they have not been able to modify how much, how, how often the graphs will fail. We have not been able to modify the return to sports rates after 50 years no, of what we think is scientific research and, and studies. We have not been able to modify many of this. So we need to stay humble, right? About even for marathon training, right? And a lot of times outcomes are not within our control. We can train very hard, but you can still fluke your 2.4 km. Understand? But we, it does not uh, mean that we should not train wisely, isn't it? Okay, and finally, you need to be grateful, right? For us to be able to run, it's really a great gift from God, right? To run and enjoy, you know, I think we should really treasure that, okay? And sometimes when you look left and right, what, the guy faster, the guy faster, you feel very uncomfortable, correct? So running, and you compare, breeds discontent. Now, so this is my principle here, right? Three principles, putting it all together, three key takeaways. Now, I'm sure all this sound very theory, right? Or not? How, the question is, how can I apply it today? How do I start? Okay, let me give you one slide here, right? Now, so firstly, you need to apply your specificity, correct? You need to decide, okay, how much time do you want to commit to running? Let's say you say, I want to run 60 minutes a week only. That's a very, very good start, right? But straight away, you do this, you apply the ratio, right? So you know for sure, 48 minutes of your week must be aerobic. You see how simple is that, right? And we know that the next 20% has to be anaerobic. Nice? Okay, so now you have broke down. Now you are obeying these principles and you are not going to overtrain because you are applying the principle of specificity. Next, you apply precision, right? You go and find out your heart rate zones, right? Easy, you use your heart rate threshold, use heart rate. And then you check your 2.4 km predicted pace to run your heart runs, okay? And then you apply super compensation. You make sure that you have sufficient rest between these two sessions. And then you also plan for planned recovery weeks over the next 12 to 16 weeks. Right? So for example, very simple. So now you have session one, session two, for example, right? Your session one is 30 minute easy run, zone two, right? Session two, you can warm up 10 minutes. Then you do the anaerobic workout for 15 minutes and then cool down 10 minutes. You see roughly here is about 65 minutes a week only, right? Obeying all the principles. 
Okay. And then your variations for the anaerobic workout can be anything, right? It can be a hard workout on the race, on the track, or it can be threshold runs at zone four. That's how you mix and match. And by this, you can actually plan out a very nice training program based on the num amount of time you can commit to a week. And yet, you can maximize and make sure you don't get injured. Right? Amazing. What now? One of you going to tell me it's very, very complicated, correct? Sounds complicated, right? Now, that's why me and Daniel here are trying to make things really simple for you. Running made simple. Okay? And here we have a calculator. A calculator that Daniel has coded amazingly, right? Which churns out training programs based on all the principles that I talked about. All the principles, right? And in this website, there are three main functions. Number one, there's a training zone calculator, right? How do you know your zones? Well, it sounds very complicated. Now, in this website, once you key in some de details like your age and your VO2 max estimate from your watch or your time trial 1.2 km, it will churn out your training zones. Next, there's a 2.4 training plan generator. It comes out with a training plan from 8 weeks to 16 weeks to run your best 2.4 km yet. All right? And it is twice a week only, 30 minutes each, obeying all the principles that we talk about. All the principles that we talk about. And you can have an optional run every week if you want, right? You can add on uh, the easy zone two runs, okay? And finally, there's a race pace calculator, how to run your optimal race on race day. All right, it's all there. Okay, so let me show you the three functions here in these three slides. Right, number one, in this website, you will go to this page, training zone calculator. You insert either your VO2 max estimate from your watch, or your 1.2 km time trial, right? Now, from here, you will churn out your beautiful zones from easy to threshold to hard, right? Okay, and all your heart rate data is there, okay? And it even comes out your 2.4 km estimate race time and how to break down your pacing for your training. So in this shot, you can actually use this to actually integrate into your own training program right now. For those 25% of you guys who have a training program, you can make sure you are training in the right intensity. Training zones calculator, right? Secondly, all right, this is why so I'm just trying to show all the arrows here. All right, zone one to four using heart rate, zone five with the pace. And then what you need to do is on your watch, you can easily set all this data into your watch so that it can alert you when you're in the correct zone. Okay, now training, training plan here, guys. Now in this training plan, you insert your VO2 max estimate, your birthday, your training start date, and the race date. Okay, and then you generate a plan. It will straight away come out a program for you right here. Obeying all the phases of training talk about from base to threshold to specific to taper. Okay. And then in, in those in red color, that's where they are the workouts, the anaerobic workouts, whereby you will do 10 minutes of warm up in zone one. All right. Uh, and cool down after each hard run. Okay. And then for these things that are recovery, these are recovery periods where you just slowly jog or walk until your heart rate drops down to zone three. All these are all on the website to help you kickstart your training program. And then during the recovery week, right? During the recovery week, you can do a benchmark test. Either you repeat the time trial or you re-input your VO2 max value from your watch. We will probably has improved over the last few weeks. You will regenerate the paces so that you are running at the most precise pace that you can have, okay? And finally, give yourself at least two to three days of rest between the hard workouts. Right? So all this will be set up and all of them will meet the, the precision, the specificity ratio that we all talked about. Okay, And if you feel good, you can always add in a 30-minute zone to run, making sure you keep to the ratio. Now, finally, race space calculator. How to run your best 2.4 km on race day. Right Now, for this one, you basically insert the race distance and your target race time. How do you know what's the target race time? You should ideally run within your limits, right? You should place your VO2 max estimate in this and it will come up with an estimated 2.4 km race time. From there, you plonk it in. All right. And then you will come up with this calculator here. How fast to run for each lap? How fast to run for each lap? Now, of course, this can be very simple maths. Lah, huh? We may make it sound a bit more fancy, but this is how you should run your best day 2.4 km. This is how you should do it. Number one, you should keep to the prescribed lap times for the first four laps strictly. You need to be disciplined. All right, you need to have an even pacing or a negative sleep. It means you must control yourself to not get too excited. Run at the prescribed pace for first four laps. If you feel, if you want even to be more precise, you can even control by 100 meters. Every 100 meters, you check, check, check to make sure you're super on the dot. 
All right, because you want to even out your energy distribution. And then in the last two laps, then you start going faster. That's where you can run your best 2.4. All right, the idea where you run fast and then slow down, got enough time to slow down doesn't work. All right, don't try that. Start slow and even pace and be and have a reasonable target based on your current fitness, based on your watch VO2. All right, fantastic, guys. And just for you guys who are very interested, those who have Strava, I don't know whether you guys may not know, if you have Strava and you're interested in us tracking your runs, you can always sign up on this form, okay? Because we want to track your experience as you try out this program, okay? You, you should have a Strava account. You should have a smart watch with an optical heart rate monitor. And uh, you hope to use this program for the next 12 weeks or 16 weeks, okay? And what will happen is that we will collect your data from your Strava account. And then you can always bounce back with us if you have any questions. And we will also ask you for any feedback, okay? Um, and yeah, scan the QR code here if you're interested to apply, okay? Fantastic. All right, now...